Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us at today's virtual State Tech Vision program. We're going to talk digital services, cybersecurity, and federal IT stimulus dollars. I'm Caroline Boyd. I'm the principal of government programs here at Meritalk. Now, we know that state and local governments are accelerating work to address cybersecurity threats to IT systems and also accelerate the delivery of modern digital services for their constituents. Fortunately, there are billions in new federal stimulus funds that are earmarked for state and local government entities. Today, we're gonna to get an update on the allocation of federal dollars to state and local governments, and also talk a little bit about how state and local leaders are planning to apply internal and federal stimulus dollars to digital services, cybersecurity, and other initiatives. We're gonna hear from speakers uh, from several states, including Tennessee, North Carolina, Illinois, and the Commonwealth of Virginia. And we're gonna to talk to some of the industry's leading experts that are collaborating with government uh, and partnering to accelerate and move forward projects uh, covered by these stimulus funds. Of course, a program like this cannot happen without the support of our sponsors. So I want to thank them uh, for participating in today's discussion. A special shout out to Recorded Future, Checkmarks, Red Hat, and Google Cloud. And of course, thanks to all of you for uh, listening in and participating and being part of the State Tech Vision program. We're looking forward to a great discussion and thanks everybody for joining us. To kick us off, I'm pleased to be joined by Congressman Don Beyer. He's from Virginia's 8th District. Congressman Beyer has represented the 8th since 2015, and he serves as the chairman of Congress's Joint Economic Committee. He also sits on the Ways and Means, as well as the Space Subcommittee of the House's Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. He had the great honor of serving uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia as the Lieutenant Governor from 1990 to 1998, and importantly, he was instrumental also in the formation of the Northern Virginia Tech Council. So he knows a little something about tech. He's a, he was appointed by President Obama to serve as ambassador to not just Switzerland, but also Liechtenstein. So Congressman, we really appreciate you for joining us today at State Tech Vision. Uh, hope you're doing well. I, I am Caroline, and thanks so much for focusing on the role of technology in state and local governments. It's a really important deal. I'm glad we're gonna talk about it. Yeah. Um, it is, um, and uh, we're glad you're here. So as I just noted, your leadership in science and tech issues is, is pretty well established. Um, how has the role of technology in government, especially in state government, changed since you were serving in Richmond in the 1990s? Well, Caroline, when I was there, which was a long time ago, it was all paper. Um, I don't, I didn't have a computer on my desk. I don't know that anybody else did. You know, we were using lots of word processing to generate schedules, but um, basically everything was mailed in and, and filled out by hand. And when you needed to talk to somebody, you had to call them up and stay on hold till you could talk to somebody or, or even better go in person, which if I always had a tax problem, it was worth it to get in the car and drive to Richmond and do it face to face because you had no real other alternatives. It's, yes. it's a very different world now. It is, and as, as I had mentioned to you earlier, I also was in Richmond in the 90s and, and know how paper-driven it was. So now we've all lived through and heard, of course, how the pandemic has highlighted some of the key technology failures um, uh, you know, across government. But it's also accelerated the adoption of new technologies to facilitate remote work, learning, automation, and the improved delivery of digital services, importantly to the citizens. So maybe from your perspective, maybe you could share a little bit about what do you think are the key technology investments that government should be considering um, as we emerge from this pandemic, stronger, more capable, and, and with better technology? Uh, that, that is a, a huge question. So let me try to break it down into pieces. Um, I think the most important piece is the, the interaction with the citizens. So anytime we think about how a citizen has to turn to state government, in our case, Virginia, um, we think, well, well, it's going to be taxes, it's going to be unemployment insurance, it's going to be consumer complaints. Uh, given industry by industry, it could be the kinds of things you need to do if you're a farmer or a car dealer or a technologist. And being able to have those interactions go quickly and easily makes an extraordinary difference. For example, let me just do personally, because that's what I know day in, day out. 
um, you know, we have a part-time housekeeper. And so you've got to report the taxes that you've withheld for her every month. And then once a quarter, you have to do the report of uh, payments made. So for a state unemployment tax. Well, in the old days, I had to do all that by hand. And it would take, you know, an hour or more, and then you, you mail it, and then you hope that they get it. And um, oftentimes, if you made a mistake, it was back and forth for six or eight weeks. Um, now, I can do it in something under 30 seconds online, and it's perfect. Uh, and then at the end of the year, when you have to do the summaries, the state provides you all 12 months in a row. And again, if it takes a minute, um, you're dawdling. Uh, so the, the efficiency there is remarkable. And then if you think through the pandemic, we had just enormous numbers of people that lost their jobs, especially in you know, restaurant, hospitality, um, direct services. And those folks got to apply for unemployment insurance. We also had the special pandemic unemployment insurance for the self-employed, you know, people that were you know, uh, personal trainers and, or music teachers, things like that. Um, once again, in the, in the old days, it would be form after form, and where do you even get the forms? Now, with the state government being able to go online to do it, it wasn't perfect, it wasn't easy, but oh my God, we can never, the state government could never have served the number of people it did unless they had turned it all into technology and made it available online. The yes. second big piece, and I should defer to your question though, and we can talk about it, is what it means for state employees and local employees and the ability to work from home um, and, it, and in times of COVID, obviously, it was very necessary. People didn't get sick. But now, post-COVID, we've discovered that people can be remarkably productive um, from home. <clears throat> they don't have the one to two hours in traffic going back and forth. They don't necessarily have to shave. I mean, I, I, for two years, um, I would roll out of bed and go right to work you know, after grabbing one cup of coffee. Uh, as opposed to getting up, showering, shaving, putting on the suit, driving downtown, you know, there's a one and a half hour difference in productivity right there. Um, th there are good arguments back and forth, but I think we are destined to find a middle way, which will ultimately be healthier and more productive. Absolutely agree. And I personally am enjoying, um, you know, the new way that we work as well. And I think most Americans are. So you were very instrumental in the passage of that American Rescue uh, plan and we know there was you know almost two trillion dollars um, that was signed into law just just over a year ago. The bill includes some specific technology funding. Um, it included about seven billion dollars for the FCC to help local schools and libraries purchase technology um, as part of that homework gap. Um, and of course, there was over two billion to improve states' unemployment insurance programs. So. State and local governments continue to use both the CARES Act and the ARPA funds to upgrade technology systems, um, not just for the COVID-related support, but you know, I think the long-term investments, right, in the community. And as you just mentioned, there's you know, long-term benefits and productivity. So many are hoping that these bills are going to have long-term transformative effect. Um, what areas do you hope to see that transformation? Like what areas do you really hope um, benefit from that transformation? And um, how are the technology investments playing a role in that? Well, I, again, Caroline, I think you and I could talk for two hours just on that one question. So let me just pick out a couple of highlights. Um, one of the, the things that we really emphasized in the American Rescue Plan and in the CARES Act was um, revitalizing, renewing the state unemployment systems. Again, my personal experience was with Virginia, where anecdotally, the software and the hardware dated back to the late 80s, before either you or I were in office in Virginia. And so God bless the folks working for Ralph Northam and, and now for Glenn Youngkin, um, but they were hamstrung by really ancient systems and, and did their best, but we ended up with really significant backlogs, which our current governors pledged to get rid of. Um, and I would have to say, um, some whopping percentage of our constituent service work on the federal level was trying to get state unemployment claims uh, attended to and, and paid. So that investment, so that I hope there's no pandemic in the rest of our lives, but whenever there's a crisis, to make sure that state governments across the country are ready to deal with it. California had a different problem, which is enormous amounts of fraud. I don't know what the, I've, I've heard things, numbers with like the billions of dollars worth. And you have to figure out that at least part of the fraud 
are insufficient technology systems where the bad guys can come in, impersonate somebody else, create a persona, and get that money. Um, the second piece that you mentioned is education. I have grandkids that are fifth grade and second grade. And boy, they are learning in a very different way than I did um, because of the technology. And I think in a better way. Uh, the, not only can they learn at their own pace, they can go over and over again the things that um, the technology discovered they didn't know very well the first time. I'm taking my first undergraduate math course in 54 years right now through George Mason University. And, uh, and it's remote. I have not, I know my professor's name, but I've never seen her or talked to her. Um, but the technology is wonderful. And uh, I so wish that I'd had it when I was in high school because I would have been much less bored <laughs> and probably would have learned a lot more, a lot faster. Um, and then the third piece is a little different from state and local government that I just wanted to bring up. Um, I'm the sponsor of the National Secure Data Act, uh, which is just a little act that sets up a, a um, what do they call them, um, a, a, a trial study through the National Science Foundation to try to integrate the different major federal databases. We have these amazing databases at uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, the IRS, the Census, uh, et cetera. Um, but they all have legacy data systems, different files, different software. Nobody, nobody can talk to each other. And when you think about the potential for machine learning to really help us understand um, who's going to get pancreatic cancer, or who's at risk for suicide, or um, what, what makes the most successful outcome for different um, backgrounds, you, you put these databases together in a way that keeps the data anonymized, you know, personally, we don't, we don't know what, what happens to Don or Caroline. Um, but the potential breakthroughs in terms of science are, are remarkable. Um, but all this takes investment and, um, and we haven't even touched on cybersecurity yet. No, well, I'm gonna pull that thread here. And, and of course it's a good segue to, um, as you mentioned, um, the secure data bill. And of course you also, you know, touched on fraud and, and some of the challenges that uh, come with this. So we, we know, and you know, state and local governments know this of course too, it's not a matter of when, it's just really if at this point um, with cyber attacks. And of course um, with the recent invasion of Ukraine, I know cyber attacks are sort of front and center on the news or at least the, the heightened risk of them. So, uh, and perhaps some of your background as a ambassador to Switzerland, um, I know you were engaged in some high level diplomacy for advocating stricter sanctions on Iran's nuclear program, um, working to end the abuses of Swiss bank secrecy. I mean, it all kind of ties to your current bill, your, your current data focus. So we know that the federal government, federal agencies, they're a major target for nation state sponsored cyber attacks. Uh, to what extent do you think state and local governments are also targets and what investments maybe should they be thinking of as they're uh, preparing uh, for those? Well, you know, I think that, uh, first of all, it's been astonishing, I think, so far as we talk that we haven't seen rush, major Russian cyber attacks on the Ukraine or the many allies that, that have lined up with Ukraine. Um, but it would be naive to think they aren't coming or that Russia doesn't have the capability. I've seen a number of essays that think, well, maybe they aren't as good as they thought, or maybe we're better at defending than we thought. Um, but you know, th that's not trustworthy. We need to do much, much better. When I was in Switzerland, which was 09 to 13, there were two major um, cyber attacks on the Swiss government. I think one from Russia, one from China that had everybody you know, really upset and confused. Um, so we think that, well, you know, if you're the Russians or the Chinese, you're probably gonna be more interested in cyber attacking treasury or CIA or the defense department. But um, we've also seen with the pipeline attack that you have rogue players everywhere that find out that if they could attack Virginia's um, treasury, for example, um, that there's money to be made. Um, I'm not sure that they learn a lot from state government in terms of things they could use internationally strategically, but, but perhaps, you know, if, if you're attacking the state of Washington with all their aluminum and their steel plants, um, you know, that could be really meaningful if you're competing on aluminum and steel. So yeah, we, we've all got to be prepared. I have, been, Carolyn, I have been impressed though with 
Um, so many of the different places that I have passwords are now insisting on uh, the, the second authentic authentication, you know, the Duo app and things like that, you know, making sure they text my cell phone. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I won't be surprised if there's a triple authentication coming soon. The other piece is, at least in the places I hang out with, um, they're not, you know, you can't use your middle name and a number anymore. <laughs> they, they want 12 to 25 characters. They want uppercase, lowercase numbers and symbols. And you, you need some kind of uh, password um, storage device to, to keep these things in. Um, because so much of our lives are driven by the different accounts that we have. You know, it's not unusual for us to have, you know, 30 to 50 different um, sign in numbers and passwords. And, and of course, none of them should be the same. Yeah, well, of course, in your own district, uh, we've got uh, lots of lots of companies who are focused very heavily on, you know, uh, collaborating with governments to make sure that they stay secure. Um, uh, I know the eighth district is home to, a, you know, a lot of the high tech community and um, is soon going to be welcoming some bigger players as well at, at National Landing. So uh, maybe just to close out here, talking a little bit about your, your home district, what role is the technology industry you know, playing in the economic success um, in your district, but also what can the industry do to help address some of the challenges that we've talked about here, whether it's uh, you know, transportation, housing affordability that, that come with you know, that success? Yeah, it, it, it's a huge part of where we are. I mean, it's it, and going back to the late 80s and early 90s, through the 90s, um, like two thirds to three quarters of all internet traffic in the world went through Northern Virginia. There's a reason that Amazon landed its HQ headquarters, uh, HQ2, uh, here in Arlington, because they, they looked and found that no other similar area in the country generated as many young people with degrees in math and computer science and engineering. Um, you know, maybe the, the more intense in Silicon Valley or MIT, but, but in terms of just total numbers, it's right here. I visited a, a manufacturing plant yesterday um, in, in the basement of a building in Springfield, uh, which is like, to best my knowledge, the only manufacturing in my district. Um, but you know what they were making is they were doing high, very high quality um, custom chips um, for computer companies. I mean, they're doing exactly what, what we need. They're supporting the industry that's right here. Uh, so it's, you know, I, one of the great blessings of Amazon coming is that Virginia Tech has decided to spend $1 billion, that's with a B, um, on a 1 million square foot campus here just for math and computer science. Wow. Um, so that, that we understand that if we generate um, the young people and the old people <laughs> that have a, a, a good math background, there's a really great way to grow um, the technology stuff in the years to come. Because let's face it, um, everything is information. You know, matter is information, energy is information. We, once we figure that out, uh, the, the sky's the limit. Are you going back to school with math in mind? Yeah, I, I I decided I wanted to try to get a master's degree in artificial intelligence and quickly discovered I didn't have the math background to get in any of the courses or, or to thrive. So I, I have to, I'm doing my uh, remedial undergraduate stuff. And it might take a year or two, you know. And unfortunately, all the work is done between 11 and 12 at night, but it's okay. It's fun. I've given oh, up crossword puzzles for, for um, pre calculus. Oh, that's fascinating, artificial intelligence. Well, you know, Congressman Beyer, thank you so much for taking some uh, time to talk to me and, and be part of this program. I really appreciate um, not just your time and your thoughtful approach, but, you know, touching on um, how important technology is for you too, not just between the secure data bill, but uh, how it plays to your district. And, you know, we're very glad that there are folks like you on the Hill who are ensuring that stimulus funds are part of the IT transformation and technology modernization that's so critical across the states here, um, across the, the nation as well. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Carolyn. My middle daughter is a coder, uh, a, a woman who codes. And I'm very proud of her. And I don't understand most of what she's talking about, but it's, uh, it's great to know that uh, she's figured out where the future is. Right, and artificial intelligence uh, may be uh, is also certainly the future. So between the two of you, you've got a, a promising uh, future ahead of you. Maybe you can work together. That'd be fun, really fun. 
All right, thank you very much, Congressman. Thanks, Carolyn. All right, now I'm gonna turn over the program to my colleague, John Thomas Flynn. He's Meritalk's Senior Advisor for Government Programs, and he's a former CIO of both the state of California and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. John also served as the president of NASIO, and he was a White House appointee uh, for both President Reagan and George H. W. Bush. All right, so I'm gonna hand things over to John for this first panel. Um, and I know he's gonna be joined by Alan Liska from Recorded Futures, uh, Jennifer Ricker from the state of Illinois, Rusty Sides from Check Marks, and Michael Watson from the Commonwealth of Virginia. John, over to you. Thank you, Caroline. Good afternoon and good morning for those on the left coast. I'm John Thomas Flynn, Senior Advisor for Government Programs with Meritalk. I'm pleased to be joined today by a panel of experts to discuss the allocation of federal stimulus dollars to state governments and how state IT leaders are planning to apply internal and federal stimulus dollars to digital services, cybersecurity, and other initiatives. Our first panel today will be addressing these issues from the cybersecurity perspective. Also, if you have a question, just go to the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen and put it in there and we'll be sure to answer your questions accordingly. Joining me today are Jennifer Ricker, Acting Secretary and Chief Information Officer, State of Illinois, Michael Watson, Chief Information Security Officer, Commonwealth of Virginia, Alan Liska, Threat Intelligence Analyst at Recorded Future, and Rusty Side, Sales Engineer Director, of Public Sector for Checkmarks. Jennifer and Mike, let's begin with you. Jennifer, while cybersecurity has been the number one priority for state CIOs for a decade or more, the pandemic was certainly responsible for a surge in threats and state cybersecurity responses. This was all confounded by closed facilities and a remote workforce from a cybersecurity perspective. What did states learn from this service, Jennifer, and how can it be applied in the future? Thank you for the question. Yeah, I think we all we all certainly saw um, a real ramp up in um, you know cyber actors taking taking advantage of opportunities, particularly around um, you know all of the funding that was flowing um, over the last couple of years fraud activities, thing, things of that nature. So, um, you know, for us, I think in particular, it really reinforced what we have been talking about um, with our business partners for many years. As you mentioned, it's been a top priority of CIOs for 10 years. Um, it certainly has been for the state of Illinois, um, and it was prior to the pandemic. I think uh, what, what it helped highlight for us, to our business partners, was um, what we have been saying um, for, for many, many years and some of the, the activities and the initiatives that we needed to move forward with, um, we weren't doing just because, um, I don't want to say because it, it was something cool that we wanted to do from a cyber perspective, right? It was something um, that maybe they didn't pay as much attention to or they didn't take it seriously, but as it was in the news, um, frequently um, over the last couple of years and became um, very, very uh, widely talked about and focused on, I think, and as we started to experience, you know, uh, with governments and we see all these examples over the last um, couple of years, I think it really made it very real to them um, and made it uh, much easier for us to, you know, implement new initiatives and or accelerate things that we already had on our uh, on our agenda. Um, and, and so I hope that what we don't have is the short memories that we often have, right, with um, disasters where we forget um, and there's uh, it, it's easy to, to stop doing the things that we've been talking about. But with, okay. with a lot of funding coming, I think I think we've got a great opportunity. here. Yeah. OK, Mike, how about Virginia? You know, and I agree with a lot of what Jennifer said. There's there's nothing like a good emergency to highlight, you know, where all of your uh, risks uh, turn into issues uh, and those problems, you know, kind of kind of rear their head. I think, um, you know, the one thing that was reinforced really heavily with this, with the pandemic um, and the response is that, you know, cybersecurity always has to be part of the picture and has to be integrated in for, for what we're doing. Um, you know, we saw that with the uh, large amounts of, of, you know, fraud attempts, as mentioned on the unemployment insurance uh, activities. We saw that with um, shifts in the actors uh, trying to target our users at home versus, uh, you know, in the workplace. What that means and what that, you know, continually highlights is that 
whenever there's a large shift in the technology, you know, strategy or approach, whatever it is and whatever it's in response to, you need to have, you know, cyber at the table to adjust for it and you need to make sure to budget for that, um, you know, as you're, as you're putting that in place. And I think, uh, you know, some of the, the funding and some of uh, leaders are starting to recognize that, as you've mentioned already, right, it remains in the top 10 priority and focus for the CIOs. Um, and I suspect it'll stay that way for a while until, you know, our picture uh, our picture gets a little more rosy, hopefully, you know, at some point with, uh, you know, some of the cyber um, uh, protections and technology that we're, we're getting in place. But it, it just it just reinforced and highlighted that, you know, significantly, um, you know, for for I think everybody, you know, the the types of technologies and challenges that they weren't necessarily anything new to us that we'd seen we hadn't seen before. Um, but the the turning on a dime, the shifting that we had to do so quickly um, just meant that it wasn't only about getting operations up and running. It was also how do we make sure that we're doing that and then securing those operations quickly to prevent it from turning into a larger scale problem. Um, right. Some areas we were able to do that quickly and some areas we've got work to do. Um, mm -hmm. But regardless, the, the knowing that it needs to be done was, was the biggest part. Sure. Our second question, I'll start with Mike. NASIO has provided a number of resources for states looking for a model or a template to follow in their cybersecurity strategy. In addition, federal agencies like the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, even the IRS have provided standards, guidelines, and best practices. Does your state follow similar policies or is it more of a hybrid? It's a great question. And I think um, the one nice thing about cybersecurity is that a lot of the, the controls and approaches and the strategies are all you know, centered around the same general concepts. There's tweaks here and there, you know, what, you know, how many characters long you want your password and those sorts of things. But for the most part, the general idea about what it is that we're after is, is um, you know, pretty consistent. In Virginia, we, we uh, you know, model after the NIST standards. Um, we have a lot of uh, uh, partners up in the DC area, of course. Um, so we make sure, you know, that we're speaking a common language with those folks. It also helps us a lot with those regulatory agencies that you mentioned, right, that they're already using uh, the NIST um, standards and structure. We're able to speak that same security uh, requirements and the same security uh, uh, um, conversations. And it, it does make that, that, uh, that conversation significantly easier, and especially when doing things like writing contracts and, and talking liability. Sure, sure. Jennifer, what about Illinois? Same thing for us. We're also misaligned and, um, you know, certainly, certainly makes it easier for us as Mike was just describing. So um, same thing for us. And, uh, you know, you mentioned, I think, strategy too. We have a statewide um, cyber strategy, um, misaligned. We also have to interact with federal, uh, federal agencies and some of their publicate, right, um, IRS Pub 1075 and, um, you know, the federal CGIS policy and those things. So all of those types of uh, standards and, and um, you know, policies that we have to interact with as well. Now let's hear from our industry reps, Rusty and Alan. Rusty, CIOs were eff effusive in their praise for their IT industry partners during this pandemic. Descri describe how your companies were able to gear up to facilitate and support the rapid deployment of state cybersecurity initiatives initiatives. So one thing is different about the pandemic versus like a localized disaster, a flood or an earthquake is this was a global change to remote remote workforce overnight for the entire world. Uh, we've never seen anything like this before. And we had to adjust and adapt very quickly. Fortunately, work and protect companies, a lot of us are already in a remote workforce capacity, except for uh, certain teams that were coming into the office on a daily basis. And the rapid changes had to be made there. But there was other parts of the industry that really had to ramp up quickly, where they were still very much focused on either physical file cabinets or uh, networks that had no outside communication, a limited number of VPN access points. All of these things had to be adjusted and scaled up. And as a result of that, a lot of technical debt was created very quickly for something that was unprepared for. Um, we, as uh, check marks for our development teams, particularly, um, they were used to coming into the office, having scrum meetings and interaction on a daily basis, went complete remote, and they tended to have to struggle through some of this as a result of the fact that a lot of those whiteboard sessions are just not as easily translated into a Zoom session as they are being in the same room. So as soon as uh, the health guidelines permitted, 
they actually started easing back into the workplace two days a week voluntarily for those that would come. And that helped really reestablish the team and get things moving again. So um, in terms of supporting our state partners, we've always been there for them. And then suddenly application security came to the forefront as being even more important than it was prior to the pandemic. Alan, what about your organization? Same question. You know, a, a lot of what Rusty said holds up for us as well. Um, you know, in our case, we were mobilizing to really understand what the remote threats are and then communicating that information to our state partners um, and, and local uh, government partners as well. With the expansion of the remote workforce, we saw increased attacks on Citrix, on VPN uh, concentrators. Um, uh, phishing attempts and uh, phishing wars all related to COVID themes and getting that information processed quickly and getting it out in an actionable way to our state partners and to our local uh, and uh, to our local government partners was par paramount for us. In addition, uh, the, um, you know, the, the, uh, pandemic also saw a, a huge increase in ransomware attacks and selling of state and local government um, accesses on underground forums. So really being able to monitor closely for that kind of activity and warning, um, warning not just our partners, um, but but you know even state and local governments that aren't our partners. Hey, we're seeing this being uh, offered up for sale on underground forum. It's something you probably want to investigate. Those were, you know, those were really important to us to make sure we got those protections out to often state and local governments that were already security constrained doing everything else, you know, um, giving them that extra level of warning. Speaking of ransomware, I think you have a book out on that, don't you? I, I do. Yeah, it just came out uh, earlier this year. Um, pre understand, prevent and recover. Um, it's a guideline on how to protect yourself from ransomware. Look forward to seeing it. Back to our state folks, Jennifer, state CIOs across the country have emphasized how the traditional methodologies and processing for designing, procuring, and building new applications during the pandemic were super acceler accelerated. Was this urgency similar for cybersecurity defenses in your state? And most of all, will these efficiencies continue post COVID? We've done um, several emergency procurements over the last couple of years, um, needing to sort of bypass the traditional methods that can take quite a bit of time in order to get, you know, what we felt was a real imperative to get um, some new tools and um, products in place for us. So, so yeah, I think that that was critical across the board. Certainly held true too, with um, from a cybersecurity standpoint, um, and, and from a longer term perspective, I think. You know, we, we were able to, um, you know, do things quicker and uh, in a more accelerated manner during the pandemic for, um, as we were under in Illinois, um, various uh, disaster proclamations. So it allowed us to, to do things um, outside of our normal processes. But um, I, I think, you know, going forward, um, you know, see, seeing how effective that was, how quickly we could get things done, um, I, I think people have seen that. Um, I think there's lots of discussions about that, but um, will it wholesale change kind of the way things look from a from a procure procurement perspective? Probably not, but um, I think we still have um, you, you know the ability to do emergency procurements when we feel that they're needed. And I think um, the one place that that we often would never hesitate would be around um, anything related to cybersecurity. Mike, what about you? It's an interesting question, you know, because I think, um, you know, we cybersecurity is a risk based discipline, right? So we're always looking and understanding risks as to, you know, how it's impacting us overall. Um, you know, when we we're looking at uh, items like procurements and such, that is just another area of risk as from a state perspective that we end up, you know, looking at and determining a lot of the controls and things that we put in place on the cybersecurity side, as well as on the procurement side, you know, were initially bypassed during COVID. And the whole concept is, we needed to stand something up quickly because it was an actual emergency. We deemed that the emergency we were dealing with was more of a risk than what we would uh, experience by bypassing those controls and stuff that we put in place, you know, within our, our organizations. And we saw this across the board. Um, it's a great testament to what we can get done when we absolutely need to, when we understand it's an imperative effort that we must 
you know, do something to fix, right? In this case, you know, save lives and make sure that our, our ability to respond to this to the pandemic was, was in place. Um, mm -hmm. On the long term, though, it's still a risk conversation. We're still talking about do we want to adjust our risk, our targets, both on the cybersecurity side and on, on the um, uh, procurement side? I think in general, on the cybersecurity side, we're pretty clear that we're not really looking to take on most risks, as, as Alan and, and Rusty have kind of mentioned already. There's pretty some significant impacts to taking on too much risk there to the point where, you know, you can shut down your organization pretty quickly. Um, so, you know, I think it's just about balancing and and. Um, whenever you go through an emergency is a good time to take a look at your risk portfolio and, and balance accordingly. Um, you know, I, I do think that cybersecurity will generally increase and continue to try to reduce risk in areas. Um, procurement might be a place where we introduce a little more, but but it's a little bit wait and see. Well, it's interesting that, uh, you know, with this acceleration of the pace of uh, design and implementation across most states, frankly, uh, it's been really a wonderful experience and a wonderful precedent to set. The problem is, as usual, you got elections. and <laughs> There's 33 governors up for election this November. And the last time we had uh, that many, I think there was a churn of something like over a dozen state CIOs changed. Uh, and for some state CIOs who will have a new governor, perhaps, perhaps that enhancement of state CIOs and their teams their positions and during their, their stature and position uh, during the COVID response may be lost. So it'll be a shame if that happens. I have a next question for Mike again. Speaking of post COVID, hopefully, the federal government has appropriated literally billions in new stimulus funds marked for state and local government entities due to the pandemic. In fact, cybersecurity funds are specifically identified. Many governors as well have announced new internal funds for cybersecurity in their budget, an unprecedented cascade of new do dollars for IT. How does your state plan to prior prioritize your cybersecurity initiatives with all this new funding? How do you do? And how do you know what to do first? It, it's a good question, and it's one um, that, of course, you know, uh, we'll, we'll muddle our way through like anything else. But the the idea is to look for those areas where we see, you know, our highest risk. I think what's great about this funding is. It's the first time that we've taken the approach of, you know, the states identify that their locals and schools and such are at a more significant risk. They don't have large staffs. They don't have the opportunity to centralize a lot like the states do because we're obviously got a, a larger presence in almost all circumstances. Um, you know, that, that challenge makes it a very large lift for every locality to implement a strong cybersecurity program, both on the governance and technology side. Um, so this is a great opportunity for both the states and the locals to work together um, to, you know, take advantage of some of those centralized efforts and, and put, um, you know, common infrastructure in place that's going to provide them protections and expertise that they did not have before. Um, you know, in Virginia, we're looking at trying to do it, you know, in that fashion. We've got a team of folks that's, that's pulled together, um, you know, to work with our localities and work with our school districts and other public entities and figure out where we can, uh, you know, put our most, um, where we can have the most impact. Generally, we know that um, we're used to spending money in, in scenarios like that where we're cleaning up messes. We are trying to get in front of it. We want to start with what we can do to provide prevention of those messages from happening. Um, and that's gonna be where most of our focus is. There are some you know, core components and core things to start with. And we think we have a good opportunity to try to get um, work with our localities and get those in place. Yeah, not to mention all those black swans that may be lurking out there, right? <laughs> yep. Jennifer, how about in Illinois? What's your prioritization with the uh, scheme for all these new dollars? Uh, really similar to what Mike was talking about. Same thing for us. Um, we've got both some uh, state dollars that um, our governor has introduced for up, for the upcoming budget um, for cybersecurity, as well as the anticipated federal funds. So um, we're looking at something very similar, and it's a little bit um, dependent, I think, too, on on what what the guidance that comes out for how we can utilize the federal dollars. But we are hoping to to kind of put together some very um, centralized program, um, modeled a little bit on what we've done with um, our program that we call the Cyber Navigators for Elections Authorities here, where we have um, a team of folks that are um, assigned regionally and um, are really there to, um, as, as Mike talked about, help with prevention, some really baseline 
um, help for, for those local governments that really don't have the resources that we have at a state or a federal level um, from a cybersecurity perspective and, and really start to do things like you know, assist them with identifying risks, do risk assessments, um, you know, sharing best, best practices, um, you know, and then if necessary, incident response, but ideally, you know, we're, we're talking about the front end, the prevention side, um, education, those things. So that's really how we're, we're looking to focus as well. Yeah, certainly the, uh, the state and local government coordination and cooperation on cybersecurity was another, you know, the, the inside uh, golden lining in the cloud, if you will, it really did, uh, it was very successful and hopefully will continue in the future. Let's talk with our industry reps again. First, Alan, from the industry perspective, how do you think states should prioritize their cybersecurity posture with all this new funding? I'm sure you're both maybe inclined to boost your own company's products and services, but I'm confident you will provide an industry perspective. Rusty? No, no, I want uh, Alan first. I, you know, it's not my role to tell different states how, how to spend their their uh, their their uh, money. And I know um, I, I know most state CIOs and CISOs will will do an excellent job of allocating it. What I will say is, I think one of the thing that one of the things that's really driving a lot of this attention is cybersecurity events that hit home um, tend to you know t- tend to spur more action. And during the pandemic, similar to the rise in ransomware attacks against healthcare, we saw a massive increase in ransomware attacks against schools. And that's one of those local things that then drives to local politicians, then drives to national politicians, which I think increases funding. And that's one of the areas that personally I'm really passionate about. And I hope a lot of that funding goes to provide better security uh, for schools from things like ransomware attacks, business email compromise, and other kinds of cyber attacks that go out there. Um, because most schools can't afford to hire a cybersecurity person, you know, oftentimes not even an IT person. So that's done at the district level. Um, and they tend to be really overwhelmed. I know Colorado has a really good model for centralizing a lot of that security. And and I'm hoping other states figure out ways to provide better security to the schools, Mm -hmm. um, for, for that, in that respect. Yeah. Rusty, how about you? What do you think of the prioritization should be? Thank you, John. Alan had some really good points there, especially with the increased focus on uh, cybersecurity attacks that were not quite as prevalent prior to the pandemic. Um, Even besides ransomware, there's now a lot more applications that are exposed to the internet that were not exposed prior. So I think the best thing to do is kind of take a step back as you're prioritizing what needs to be addressed. What's your highest risk? Which applications are now exposed that you were not exposed before? And what steps did you have to take to quickly get a solution that created technical debt? You may have been in a situation where you have to just go out and find who's got the talent to be able to, to solve a problem quickly, but it may or may not have been the, the, the best solution or the most secure solution. So now that you've got the opportunity to reflect, go back and take a look and see what level of efforts involved, um, what can be done quickly, what can be mitigated uh, best, and then what's better to push out for a later date. Um, when you're looking at these applications that are now exposed, they're a, now it's a new attack vector, and you have to make sure that that attack vector is addressed and mitigated properly so that you're not a victim of all of these new cybersecurity attacks. It's, it will be interesting to see how this all develops. Okay, back to Jennifer. How's the process for accessing these federal funds working out? I'm getting mixed messages from speaking with some of your colleagues. Uh, with states determining their use of the funds. How's that going to work out? And with local government also in the hunt and the traditional federal uh, government bureaucracy to contend with, it must be a challenge. For um, the funds that had come previously, it's been it's been pretty easy for us, for our agency. You know, that, that's something where we don't have to um, deal with the direct um, application and, and all of the paperwork that comes with uh, federal funds. Uh, for the for the new infrastructure funds that have the cybersecurity um, grant in it, I think again that's a little bit to be seen, right? I think um, we haven't got the the notice uh, the the NOFO has not come out yet. We don't totally know um, exactly what will qualify. So the things I was talking about earlier about that centralized program we'd like to do because we think that would be 
um, the most beneficial for the most entities in the state. Um, we're still waiting to hear, will that be allowed or how much of that will be allowed? So um, still to be seen a little bit for, for that, um, but uh, I think they've done, you know, they've tried to model that the best they can by utilizing, um, you know, the federal systems that were already in place that that we're used to accessing, um, you know, Homeland Security grants through. So um, I think, you know, as quickly as they want to try to get the funds out, I think they're they're going to make it as as um, I don't want to say easy, but at least um, knowable as possible through a process that already exists. So we're not recreating that wheel, but um, yeah, a little bit still to be seen. Mike, how about the Commonwealth of Virginia? Are you uh, successful at uh, getting some of these funds or is it still a mixed bag? So and I'll echo a lot of what Jennifer said. You know, the, the, the funds that are coming, we are waiting to kind of see uh, what this is going to look like to 100% know how they're going to be you know, allocated. I'm optimistic based off of what we've heard so far um, that the process and the uh, um, conditions around the grants are going to be reasonable and done in a way that's going to actually facilitate a good cybersecurity program. Um, I always say, you know, cybersecurity centralizes really well compared to a lot of other um, components. The the same you're looking for the same things in all the places that you know whatever your organization structured like it it all looks very similar. So we we want to be able to to leverage that, and make efficient use of funds. Um, the prior ones, and I know I, I I can understand where you're coming from with some of the conversations. Uh, with the uh, funding that was tied to, to some of the COVID pieces. Some, some states invested heavily in, you know, technology and, and stretch some were very much all medical, um, you know, related expenses, and it was kind of all over the place. Uh, Virginia focused mostly on um, externally facing things and a lot of the medical pieces. Uh, there was a large focus on broadband expansion, um, knowing that folks that were at home without internet especially those that were uh, students and such did not have really great methods to be able to, to access um, education. And at the time, not knowing how long they were gonna be in that position, they, they wanted to make sure they had some, some things uh, available. Um, recognizing and, and now we're kind of circling back and trying to plug some of the, the areas that we know we need to fund a little bit better. Um, and the, the current you know, budget and governor has been very supportive of making sure those cybersecurity initiatives and such are, are being addressed. Um, and we should be able to close the gap with the, with the additional funding coming up. Okay, last question for all our panelists. Um, we're, let's keep on time here. So take about it a minute or so. Jennifer, first, remote work symbolized the reaction to the pandemic, particularly for state and local governments and for private sector as well. Are your state employees back to the office? And what are the cybersecurity implications? It, it's a hybrid, you know, for, for us in Illinois, a lot of, there's certainly some folks that, that never really went home just due to the nature of their jobs, but a vast majority of our workforce had been uh, completely remote. But over the last year, you know, agencies have, have brought back some or all of their employees. So I think, you know, right now there's, there continues to be sort of a hybrid of, of either in the office um, or partially in the office, some still 100% remote. I think, you know, the future of this is likely um, to continue to see, at least for us here, some hybrid version of this. I think, you know, it wasn't um, perfect uh, when it started uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, but we certainly uh, were able to quickly make this work, send everybody home. They operated successfully for a really long time. So I think if nothing else, you know, we've proven it can be done, it can be done securely. Um, it, it's certainly part of our, our long-term uh, preparations, knowing that this is, this is always the possibility this could become uh, the future. Mm -hmm. Mike, what's it like in Richmond and the rest of Virginia? Yeah, it's, and it's similar, right? We, we know that, um, you know, we've got people in various stages. The states all have, you know, many different lines of business. So each line of business has its own sort of, you know, requirement. So we've got, you know, a lot of organizations are, uh, that are doing frontline work are in and have always been, you know, in place. And then we've got some folks that are um, more hybrid or or remote in, in some cases. Um, and I think in the cybersecurity perspective of that, um, we're planning for everybody to be anywhere at this point, right? Trying to not structure that into the model um, seems like not a good idea, especially when we've already proven that, you know, when things happen, if we need to be remote or we need to change our locations, that is an easy thing for us to do work-wise, 
Um, so we need to be prepared for it. It's part got to be part of our model. And I think that's what we're, we're looking towards and building in for, for any future structure that we're putting in place. Lastly, let's hear from industry again. Rusty, then Alan to close us out. The uh, workplace is definitely a hybrid model right now. Many of us have been remote even prior to the pandemic and we'll, we'll continue to operate that way. But those have been displaced from the office some are going to stay that way. They found the uh, efficiencies that were not there before, and it was a leap of faith that they were never really willing to take prior to the pandemic kind of forcing their hand. And they're seeing that uh, the remote workforce actually does work. It is efficient. It, there are things that are advantageous. Then on the other hand, there's teams that have to be in the same room to be productive. And those are the teams that are moving back into the workplace, whether it's two days a week or a full work week like they were doing prior. And then from a, a from our perspective of supporting state and local government, we as a sales force can come on site, on premise. We prefer to, to see our uh, customers face to face. We tend to do a lot better problem solving and solution solving in that capacity, but we're flexible and understanding that remote workforce is, is a kind of the new normal, so to speak. And we are fully supporting any kind of interaction we can do remotely as well. Um, we're here as an industry to support you guys in any way we can. Thanks, Rusty. Alan? Close us out. I found that being at home, I have access to as much Diet Dr. Pepper as I want, and I don't have that in the office, so I'm not going back. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think what everybody said is accurate. That you know, we're we're going to be hybrid going forward. Um, you know, there are a lot of efficiencies that people found by uh, that that you can gain by working from home and um but there are still things that need to be done in the office so i do think that you know again echoing what everybody else said i think that is the way forward and i also think to what rusty said earlier a lot of the remote infrastructure that was set up before was set up very quickly and now you know with the assumption that it was going to be taken down very quickly and now that that's turned out not to be the case going forward, um, really reinforcing that infrastructure, securing that infrastructure, and you know, incorporating that into your security workflow becomes paramount to making sure that it's as safe as the rest of your organization is. Thanks, Alan. With that, I want to once again thank our panelists for taking the time to join us for such an interesting conversation. And thanks to our audience for joining us for this discussion. Remember, audience members, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and we'll respond accordingly. Now I'm going to turn things back over to Caroline for a quick introduction of our next panel. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you, panelists. That was a great discussion. Um, all right, we're going to switch gears now, and we're going to turn our attention to digital services. We're pleased to have J.P. McGinnis from Tennessee, Kevin Tunks from Red Hat, James Weaver from North Carolina, and Denise Winkler from Google Cloud. So John, I guess I'm just gonna turn it right back to you to get started with the discussion. Thank you, Caroline. And again, good day to everyone. I'm John Thomas Flynn, Senior Advisor for Government Programs with Meritalk. I am pleased to be joined by another panel of experts today to discuss the allocation of federal stimulus dollars to state governments and how state leaders are planning to apply their own internal funds and the federal stimulus money to digital services, cybersecurity, and other initiatives. Our second panel today will be addressing these issues from the digital services perspective. One of my favorites. Remember audience, if you have any questions, please include them in the Q&A section on the bottom of your screen and we'll get responses to you accordingly. Joining me today are our panel, JP McGinnis, Deputy Chief Information Officer, State of Tennessee, Jim Weaver, State Chief Information Officer and Secretary at the Department of Information Technology in the state of North Carolina, Kevin Tunks, Technology Advisor and Application Architect at Red Hat, and Denise Winkler, Strategic Business Executive, Social Services and Labor Programs at Google Cloud. Thank you all for agreeing to participate today on our panel. Let's begin with our state leaders, Jim and JP. First, Jim, while digital services, online services, citizen services in general have been growing in state government for many, many years, the pandemic certainly was responsible for a surge in these initiatives. How did the process work to get all your state agencies, 100 or more of them, 
even identify, let alone prioritize and build these applications. The CIO's office on these matters was not always welcome. When I was CIO in Massachusetts, especially California, I was not very welcome to come into departments and encourage them to do a complete IT overhaul of their IT systems. COVID changed some of that, right? Yeah, it did. And, and I wasn't here in North Carolina for the start of the pandemic, uh, but was very much involved in the state of Washington at the time. Um, and again, the governor convened every day. The cabinet was together focused on COVID. I still remember in January when the first time we had an emergency cabinet meeting and this thing called COVID was first discussed. As you know, Washington was the, the tip of the spear, unfortunately, for what we saw across the country. But what we saw was the fact that this, this was a, a crisis of immense nature, and that provides for a lot of opportunities. And really, at the end of the day, it, it, what was critical was data and access to data and knocking down the data siloed. And through that, we were able to start doing some really creative things. We had two small companies up north in Washington you may have heard of. I won't mention their names. But anyway, uh, they were very much involved in, in facilitating a lot of technological type of advancements that we needed really a, a legacy portfolio that got overhauled um, in, in, in amount of sh uh, short periods of time. I think, you know, we talk about uh, vaccination management systems, uh, uh, disease reporting systems, things of that nature that were designed to focus on a specific thing, but COVID really changed the outlook and, and the performance measurements that were needed across these systems. And that really spurred a lot of innovation and spurred a lot of use of technology and really started getting some of these newer technology sets that we as CIOs talked about a lot, but now the business started to see the value of those technologies. And then it was the faucet was open and there was right. no turning the faucet off after that. So yeah. very fortunate to see that. And, and to some degree here in North Carolina, the same things occurred likewise. Um, a lot of uh, great technology partners here in the, in the research triangle um, worked very hard with North Carolina government and a lot of the similar activities occurred. So I think what you saw across the country is no matter where you were at some point in time, you had to take advantage of these technology sets to be able to react in the quickness that we needed to, to respond to the pandemic that was occurring. Sure, sure. Uh, JP, how about in Tennessee? I, I understand you had an interesting perspective there with some of the old school and some of the new school in, in prioritizing and getting their IT systems up. Yeah, it, you know, I would echo what Jim says, partners are essential uh, during this time. Um, we did have some practice, I guess you would say, at emergency response with the bombing during Christmas time of, of uh, you know, right on Christmas Day. Um, but what we found is that what the pandemic has done to us, it, it created an unprecedented workload at the front door of many of our agencies like the Department of Health and also the Department of Labor, which handled unemployment and things of that nature. So the resistance that we would normally see to change was actually very welcome at, during, during that time. And um, our commissioners were very good about sharing the good experiences they had with other agencies. So some of those roadblocks we traditionally saw were kind of knocked down for us just through, by circumstance. Mm -hmm. This one for JP and Jim again. Okay, JP, let's start with you on this one. Was there any kind of model or template your state used to organize and deploy these new services? You have probably more than 100 agencies, just like most states, and I'm sure a good many were clamoring for new services. How'd you prioritize it? We organized them into buckets, John. We have a cloud bucket. We have an enterprise data analytics bucket. We had, certainly have a cybersecurity bucket. We have a process automation bucket, and then we have kind of a catch-all bucket we call it infrastructure and modernization. Basically, all of those types of projects that don't fit cleanly in the first four bu buckets. It allowed us to organize our work and present it to the Financial Stimulus Accountability Group, which really doled out the, the money from the uh, American Rescue Plan to specific organizations within the state. And, and through, that, through that just small framework, we were able to to codify exactly what the outcomes would be, and uh, you know, which is important with with the federal money that we spend. So it's it's been really helpful to organize it into buckets, as we call them. Mm -hmm. Jim, how about you in North Carolina? How did you prioritize all your uh, desperate agencies, so to speak? 
Well, I, I think the pandemic kind of drew some that are uh, had to um, push forward some of those prioritization efforts. Obviously, um, we're looking at governance and enterprise architecture, meaning the same things that JP talked about. But we also looked across the country at our colleagues, because no matter what um, business you were from a government aspect, human services, we're all facing the same types of issues. Public health was facing the same type of issues. Unemployment, a huge one, was all facing the same types of issues. And really, that's where I think our community as state CIOs, we started coming together. And we're, we're more alike than we are different in many cases. And I think there was a recognition of that similarities. And we were able to start adopting and not reinventing the wheel. I know, um, and you know, again, in some of my days in Washington era, there were certain states that we were adopting technologies from, and there was other states that were adopting what we did with that technology and moving it to their respective state. Um, and similar here to North Carolina as well, that that process followed up and down as we looked across our peer sets to see what they were doing, working with our industry partners and, and what they were focused on and really looking at the success stories and then how do we adopt that to make it functional within the state that we were in. Great. Uh, let's bring in our industry folks now, Kevin and Denise. Denise, CIOs were quite effusive in their praise for their IT industry partners during this pandemic. Describe how your company was able to gear up, if you will, to facilitate and support the rapid development of citizen service initiatives, especially given the remote workforce environment. That's a great question, John. Um, what we did at Google was to focus first on what on the problems that our clients, state government, local governments were facing. And really it went across several Points. One, we made a point to enhance what already existed. Um, government agencies in the midst of the COVID could not rip and replace anything. Uh, they needed help immediately. Um, we created solutions that could be integrated with existing legacy systems. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted the ability to implement in days and weeks, not months and years. It was a crisis situation. Um, we also wanted to provide what we were doing at a predictable cost. Uh, this was a time when volume was just completely unpredictable. So bringing things that were that had a predictable cost. And then also really bringing in from Google's perspective, some of the Google ecosystem that only we can bring in. Things like maps and, and ways and translation, especially things like AI and ML, which government has been adopting, but doing it relatively slowly. Uh, but bringing those things in, in the form of intelligent agents, um, automating document processing, those types of things to help sure. them be able to expand their ability to deal with the volume of citizens who needed assistance. Yeah. Kevin, same question. How did your folks at Red Hat, how did you gear up to support your state and local government partners? Yeah, we're, we're really fortunate to have a, a group of people who work at Red Hat that are with a lot of really deep technical experience. And many of us, including myself, came from government experience ourselves. So we had a, a familiarization. We understood the types of processes and the changes that our customers were going through. So we really found ways to bring that uh, experience to bear and try to anticipate the types of challenges that our customers were going to have and leverage uh, our experience really bringing uh, customers across that gap of going from very traditional technologies, very, you know, very rigorous processes that tended to be fairly slow to helping them move into a, a faster, lighter weight, simpler process to take advantage of things like the cloud and containerization and platforms uh, that can really accelerate those outcomes. So it, 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 we brought a lot of resources to bear, but hopefully it was in a way that was uh, could let could let everybody continue to build off of those fast steps onto longer longer term new habits. Sure. Uh, Jim, uh, state CIOs across the country have emphasized how the traditional methodologies and processes for designing, procuring, building new applications during the pandemic were super compressed. Describe this experience in your state, and more importantly, perhaps, will these efficiencies continue post-COVID? 
Yeah. So what I what we saw, I think, across the country, John, was more migration away from the traditional waterfall methodologies of, of system development uh, life cycle to more of an agile process. I jokingly had called it Wagile in between. It was a combination of waterfall and agile. But I think we're now getting to the other side and really starting to focus more on an agile methodology. And part of that, too, came with our business partners in the agencies understanding that there was a level of commitment that needed to be provided by them as well for Agile to be very successful. And I think we're seeing that now from our um, agency partners that they are making that commitment and we are starting to get to those well-defined sprints and those outcomes um, and, and seeing a different success rate than we have in the past. What we also saw was a lot of the wavering of more of the bureaucratic traditional procurement rules uh, during the pandemic. And part of me is fearful that we're gonna start seeing the return of the bureaucracy in the procurement process as we are now hopefully past the pandemic in an endemic stage, if you will, or phase. And we're gonna start seeing some of the capabilities that we had to do things differently in the procurement aspect starting to maybe go by the wayside and the old way of business starting to come back into existence. So we're, I think we're gonna fight feverishly um, to, to try to block that from happening, but um, that is a fear of mine looking forward. JP, talking about the efficiencies and the compression of the, of the whole life cycle of uh, our kind of work, how, how did it occur in Tennessee? In Tennessee, one of the first things we did was we reached out to the chief procurement office, which, which governs our whole procurement process in the state. And uh, we worked out a process with them that actually cut time away from the overall process. As long as we maintained a competitive um, uh, procurement strategy and we followed the rules, the new rules that have been set up, we're good to go. And it's been working great and we, we don't see it changing. I think everybody likes it this way and um, we certainly like it this way. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we make heavy use of like the, the NASPO cloud contracts and things like that. JP, speaking of post COVID, hopefully, the federal government has appropriated literally billions in new stimulus funds earmarked for state and local government entities due to the pandemic. IT departments are cautiously anticipating a significant portion. Are you looking at expanding digital services and other initiatives with these funds? We're looking, not only looking at expanding, but we're looking at accelerating more, more than that. You know, most of the things that we asked for in our request to the, uh, what we call the FSAG, um, are things we had on our, our roadmap way out in the future. And um, now we can pull them into about a three year window. So for us, it's about acceleration, um, but it's also delivering on those digital services and uh, delivering on them well. Uh, Jim, also, same question. What are, what are North Carolina's plans for uh, the stimulus funds and expanding city, citizen services? Well, digital transformation is an extremely high priority here in North Carolina. Um, the governor has really uh, looked at leveraging the ARP funding to really spearhead uh, broadband, which, again, you need connectivity, you need cyber, you need privacy, and you need cloud, I think, to be successful in the digital transformation and so Governor Cooper is very much investing in broadband here and addressing our digital inequities that exist in the state. Uh, IIJA is providing us phenomenal opportunities to do things differently from a cyber aspect and more importantly, working with our local communities and improving our cyber posture overall. Um, we hired our first chief privacy officer, state's first chief privacy officer back in December. So Cherie Givens is on board now and we're starting to spearhead that privacy framework as well. And again, moving forward with our cloud migration strategies. I think for the first time as state CIOs, we, we are, I, know, I hate to use the word flush with money. Our biggest problem right now is resources. Um, huh. and, I, and, and many of us are challenged across the country with the, between the great resignation that's occurring as well as the, market, um, the marketplace actually um, picking and choosing who they wanna go work for. Um, it's put us into an interesting dilemma, especially here in the Raleigh area, North Carolina, where we have a, a significant number of major um, partners, Red Hat included, that's also competing for the same talent uh, that we are as a state. And as I hear my private sector partners are, com are commenting about the, the lack of talent that's out there, not that it's not out there, they're just being able to pick and choose where they want to go. Um, we at the state level are, are encountering that problem even more so. So 
Uh, I think across the board here, we're seeing about a 20 percent uh, turnover of staff right now uh, throughout the, the state government level um, across every agency. No one's been immune from this. Yeah, I'm sure that's a big problem all over the country. How, Jim, speaking of this, how's the process? This is kind of like the where's the money question. How's the process for access, accessing these federal funds working out? Sometimes that federal, federal bureaucracy can be a real challenge. Well, I think North Carolina is fortunate. Um, you know, Governor Cooper has a, a very good working relationship with the Biden administration. Um, we have a number of former cabinet members that are now up uh, working as part of Biden, uh, President Biden's administration as well. Um, we, we have a process in place for how to receive those fun that funding stream, how it comes in the state and how it'll disperse from the state there. Um, it was interesting. Our, a colleague of mine the other day uh, made the reference that uh, she felt like she was a trust fund child. Um, and that was her analogy that she used for the, the federal funds that she knows they're there. We're just waiting to to be able to get to get to them and access them. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's part of where we're at here uh, as well. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at we know we know how much money is coming. We kind of have we have that budget in place. We, we know what programs we're going to be heavily investing in. Um, and now it's just a matter of that cash flow moving through the system at a speed that will support the amount of work that we want to try to get done. Sure. So could it improve? Yes. Is it totally bad? No. Yeah. Uh, JP, you indicated in our previous discussion that Tennessee was having significant success. Tell us more about the about the process. And I think you mentioned two hundred million dollars already. Yeah, just just under two hundred million. We we had been working on ever since we heard about ARPA. We had been working on, you know, ooh, what can we get? What can we get? Um, and uh, we went through seven iterations within our within our agency. And um, then I was told, JP, go big. <laughs> um, so um, I did. And um, you know, when we put our package together in those five buckets I described earlier, um, our, our best hope was that they were gonna approve everything. And our worst fear was they were gonna approve everything, right? Because it's, it's a significant amount of additional work that we're gonna have to coordinate and manage and, and procure and et cetera. So what we did was we built in a, a lot of um, administrative support within the ARPA request so that we wouldn't get bogged down with um, what I call organizational cholesterol, which just sorts of you know slows things down. Um, but um, we've been very successful. We we did get about 196 million dollars approved. Um, we're already um, active on uh, four projects, so we're in good shape. Mm -hmm. Great. Back to uh, the industry partners, Kevin Denise. Kevin, from the industry perspective. What were some of the lessons you learned or best practices you've witnessed as far as the state citizen service efforts were concerned? How did the state and local governments get it right or how did they get it wrong? Yeah, I, I, I think one area that, that many, many got them right and, and, and our two guests here from uh, public sector are, are really great examples of it. There was just a lot of leadership. There were folks that said, hey, we need to get things done and we're going to find the right partners, and we're going to go get things done. And 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 that I think that attitude, that leaning forward uh, capability, really was really something to commend. Um, and and in an area of leadership that I think is now making it more available to many other folks across the country to be able to follow uh, the lead on, on the decisions that were made. So that's one area. I think the other area is really breaking down problems into much smaller sets and focusing on what the specific outcome is that you're looking for. Um, it, you know, th this idea of it's all got to happen all at one time and we got to, you know, solve the entire, you know, boil the whole ocean kind of concept, which many government programs have to do because of funding, because of procurement rules, because of a lot of the bureaucratic cholesterol, I like that phrase. Uh, that can build up in systems. It, that process, I think, as you can simplify, you bring it down into smaller pieces, you become more agile. That I think are, are areas that has had a huge, uh, you know, just an injection of change and speed that's a positive silver lining uh, coming out of, uh, out of the COVID phase. 
I think the last thing I want to mention, and this really goes back to what Secretary Weaver was talking about in terms of talent and skill sets, there's so much turnover. There is a lot of competition for talent right now. The technologies that are now rapidly being adopted with cloud and digital modernization and, 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 and newer components and platforms that are being adopted, these are new skill sets too. So there is this point where you've got to infuse culture and training to build capacity across the board. Um, and so there's there's this this kind of push and pull process where partners are bringing those those capabilities, um, but it is it is that all in spirit from the business side of an organization to the technical side of an organization to the partners like Red Hat and Google and others that are coming in to help to really collaborate and solve those problems. Hmm. Denise, how about Google? What did you see states do well in digital services, and where might they need additional work? Well, I, I want to echo what Kevin said. I think that the leadership that CIOs and IT professionals in, in government were really some of the true heroes. They really stepped out. Right. They took risks in a way that they really had not done before. And what I thought was amazing was how successful it was, really, in partnership. It was really the 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 citizens and individuals and constituents we were able to serve by taking that was really amazing. Uh, and that would not have happened if the IT leaders across the country hadn't step, you know, stepped out of their comfort zone, if you will. Whether, whether it was voluntary or not, I think we all got kicked out of our comfort zone with COVID. Um, but the other thing I think that you know, cloud really showed its power during COVID, uh, the ability to scale, um, the ability to be flexible on demand. Um, I think cloud really stepped into its own, if you will, uh, in the public sector. But the other thing that I thought was really interesting is that the whole movement of digital transformation uh, and incremental modernization, but digital transformation is really, um, evolved as a way to address constituent equity and access to services. Um, it's very, it, it allows constituents to access services anytime, anywhere. Um, and I thought that was really interesting that it really emerged as one of the keys to equity. Okay, folks, last question. I'll start with Jim. State CIOs in NASIO surveys has said that with the experience during the pandemic, major changes have affected how their state does IT. Do you agree? And what will those new changes be? Yeah, so I, I do agree. Um, and, and first and foremost, I think, we, I, I don't know if state government ever imagined an environment where employees be working remotely. Uh, state government has been traditionally known as servicing the, the constituents from brick and mortar, and we're not doing that anymore for, for most part. I mean, yes, there are some agencies that need to still do that, but really, we're really looking at a mobile workforce. And, it, and it's interesting here, especially in my case, for my agency, about two-thirds of our employees are full-time remote work all five days a week, and they're 26% roughly are on a hybrid schedule. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, we, we just had a one part of my organization had I jokingly referred to as a reunification. First time they were together in two years um, and they, they got together and they had a SWAT chart up. And one of the threats was continued remote working. And I found that fascinating because they were really honing in on that they lost work life balance um, with the remote workforce. So while on the one side it's a positive, on the other side, some employees are starting to recognize that that is a um, a threat and, and they lost control of their day because the day just continues to go and go as we know. So I, I think some type of a hybrid remote is, workforce environment is gonna stay here. But we, we, you know, as we look at the economy, as we look at things that are going on, um, especially here in our state, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna continue to support that remote workforce. I think the other thing that's gonna be interesting is we've seen what we can do in procurement. We've seen what the improvements can be. And now our challenge there is to go ahead and get that institutionalized um, as opposed to allowing the uh, cholesterol to return, uh, as JP mentioned uh, earlier. So I think that's going to be another huge one. 
And then lastly, really, is there, there is an appetite to start looking at newer technologies that drive digital transformation, that drive value and outcomes to our, to our residents here in the state. And Denise hit it. I mean, we, we have to start driving the and addressing the digital inequity that exists here across the state, uh, across the country. And I think uh, there's going to be a lot of renewed focus and efforts to make sure that that happens and we can be better at servicing all constituents in the state, not just those that can get connected. Yeah. Uh, JP, same question. Uh, perhaps that enhancement that Denise mentioned, the enhancement of state CIOs and their team's position and stature during the COVID response, it may be lost. And it's interesting with 30 some governors coming up for election this fall, including Tennessee, the CIO and their team's finest hour during the pandemic may be forgotten. What do you think? You know, it's a challenge we all face. <clears throat> um, I think that organizations go through biorhythms. I've seen it for years and years and years. And I think right now, maybe at this moment, we might be in the high of the technologist. Um, you know, and then at some point, they'll realize how much money we've spent. And then those fiscal people will reassert their position on top and will be kind of down the curve a little bit. But I think it's just a natural biorhythm. I think it's about state government, um, civil servants responding to the need. And whether you're IT or fiscal or you're on the, you know, the, the end user services side of things, I think it's just about state governments stepping up and, and servicing and doing what needs to be done, regardless of what it takes. Yeah. You know, and I would echo what Jim said about the work life balance. You know, what we've seen is that your days seem to be butt to butt to butt like with meetings, right? With no break in between. So you don't have that casual ch chat with someone in a hallway or going to lunch with someone or that commute back and forth to work for me used to be thinking time. Mm -hmm. um, now it's a it's a 15 step walk to the cafe, as I call it. Um, mm -hmm. And um, which the cafe is way too close, um, but um, it, it's it's certainly changed our lives, and we have to be cognizant that we're spending so much time focused on work. And, and John, if I could just add there real quick, uh, sure. the pandemic in many ways was our chief innovation officer. It opened up a number of doors and opportunities that, on the technology side, we could walk through. We could provide creative solutions to meet the business needs and the outcomes they were looking for, and more importantly, be able to deliver on those. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what got us credibility. That's what got us a seat at the table. And I think we're going to continue to be there because I, more than ever, there is a reliance and dependence upon the technology that underpins all the business um, that's going on across our agencies. Yeah. And I was saying before, uh, with the election in November coming up and 30 some uh, governors up for election or re-election. Last time this happened, I think it was five, six years ago, I guess. And I think uh, there were almost half uh, ended up with new chief information officers the following January. Uh, so consequently, that COVID-related appreciation in esteem during COVID may vanish. I think there arose in Egypt a king who knew not Joseph. So Kevin and Denise, first Denise, final thoughts on how the pandemic has changed IT delivery in state and local governments and the industry serving them? I think that I, much, much like Jim just said, I think that our ability between CIOs and, and your tech partners like Google and Red Hat, we were able to come together quickly, efficiently and solve the problem. That partnership and the relationships that we've built with each other, I think will continue to exist uh, and hopefully flourish. Um, yes, I, I was gonna say, I hope so I as well. In fact, the industry can have a great influence on these new governors in their transition phases by uh, being the putting emphasis on how important it is to have a strong chief information officer on the team. Kevin, close us out. Well, thanks so much, and and thanks for such an amazing panel and being here with everybody. This is it's it's really truly an honor. The I, I do think that it has changed forever. I think partly not because of the pandemic, but frankly because of what 
uh, citizen and resident expectations are of how to interact with government. I think that more than anything else has changed uh, how, how these interactions will continue to go forward and how much technology will underpin these, whether it's as an employee of a state or as a, re a resident of a state looking for services or interacting. The way that we interact with the world is different and our expectations are different. And I think that the technologies that are now here between cloud and platforms and containers and all the rest, those are now core expectations. They're no longer emerging technologies. They're no longer something out there in the future. Those are very much now and, and are being adopted, you know, at, a, at just at a much faster pace. So I think there's a lot of uh, uh, change and, and really uh, very positive times ahead yeah. uh, as government makes that transformation. Yeah. I just remember in California a few years back when Governor Brown took over, within a year, he kicked the uh, CIO off the cabinet. So, so be careful there, Jim. <laughs> I guess you don't have an election to worry about, though. No, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, Governor Cooper is good for another two years, two and a half years. So <laughs> yeah, good, good, good enough. With that, I want to once again thank all of our panelists for taking the time to join us for such an interesting conversation. And thanks to our audience for joining us. Uh, I see we already have a few questions in the Q&A box, as promised. We'll get back to you with responses. Finally, we hope you enjoyed our State Tech Vision program today. Now I'll turn the floor back over to Caroline to wrap things up. Thank you, John, for facilitating two great discussions. And thanks to all the panelists for participating and being part of today's program. As we close out the program, I want to again um, thank our sponsors, uh, thank the speakers, thank you to Congressman Beyer as well uh, for his participation. And as a reminder for everyone, uh, today's virtual event has been recorded. So you will be able to see an archived version of it uh, after the program ends. And we'll make sure we send a note to everyone with that link. So I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day and thank you for being part of Meritalk's State Tech Vision. <laughs>